Up next, we have one of our keynote speakers, the owner and creator of torontojobs.ca and the Canadian Music Expo. This is Mark Belage. Thanks very much, Dee. Uh, great to be here, and uh, a great uh, afternoon to uh, everyone watching, depending on what time you're, you are watching. First of all, I'm not a musician. I uh, got to grade five piano, and uh, that was about it. Uh, I hated uh, playing music, uh, but I love listening to music, so I'll be listening to two or three radio stations or Spotify at the same time. And uh, I, I really am an entrepreneur. Uh, I have a background in accounting. I did my CPA through school. And um, I just I really am a chameleon because uh, I just uh, enjoy all different aspects, connecting with people and so on. And uh, so today I'm really going to talk about uh, what I see as uh, music and the music industry in Canada, as well as uh, entrepreneurship and uh, what people should know about uh, employment. And if you're a musician looking for a job, what you may, may want to be earning. I have some stats uh, in here as well. And I also have some uh, good information about what people are looking for in jobs as well. So if you're an organization that's looking to uh, hire, you might want to consider some of these points uh, as well. So uh, I live in Mississauga. I'm uh, married, have a couple of kids. And uh, I started up the uh, Canadian Music Expo about five years ago now. Uh, it's been a great ride. Uh, I've met a lot of great musicians, uh, both starting up and ones that have been uh, have, a, have had a great career and uh, enjoyed meeting both sides of it because you see the potential in the ones that are just starting up and I see the ones that have made it uh, have been successful over the years and kind of what they've done. So I'm going to share some of those uh, thoughts with you as well as we go along here through the next uh, 45 minutes or hour or so. I'm also a, a CPA, CA. I did that back in, back in the day. Uh, so I'm uh, an accounting uh, person as well. So I understand the numbers and the business of music and uh, entrepreneurship and, bu and business in general. So, so I'm going to share with you first off some uh, music facts and some interesting tidbits about music that maybe you didn't know about, uh, but over the course of the last five years as I've been doing the Music Expo, I've found out all this cool information about music and, and how it works and the industry and the business itself. Uh, and I, I want to share that with you. So first of all, there's, there's 35,000 singers and musicians in Canada, which is a pretty phenomenal uh, number. Uh, in, the, in Canada, uh, or during the pandemic stage from Jul January 3rd to July 2nd, uh, the top five Canadian artists in music-wise are The Weeknd, uh, Drake, Justin Bieber, Tory Lanez, and The Tragically Hip. Tragically Hip, you know, that they're not uh, really performing anymore, of course, with uh, Gord Downey passing away, but they're still in terms of the top five Canadian music selling uh, artists. Uh, Canadian music consumption is actually up by 6% year over year with the pandemic uh, upon us, which is fantastic uh, for Canadian music, for music in general, as more people are turning to uh, different kinds of uh, listening and different kinds of entertainment uh, for their uh, support. Another interesting tidbit was that Fender uh, Guitars is experiencing a record sales year in 2020. Uh, they, uh, the chief executive of uh, Fender Guitar said that 2020 will be the biggest year of sales volume in Fender history record days of digit, double digit growth, e-commerce sales, and beginner gear sales. So a lot of people picking up a guitar, a lot of people picking up music. Uh, the uh, guitar app that they have, which is called Fender Play, saw its user base increase to 930,000 from 150,000, so six times increase between late March and late June of 2020, uh, with close to 20% of the users being between uh, or under 24 and 70% under 45. So quite a diverse uh, group of people who are looking to uh, learn how to play guitar, not only with a real guitar, but also with the app. Uh, female users 
of guitars uh, increased from increased from 30% before the pandemic to 45%. So females are a bigger chunk as well. Uh, Gibson, Taylor, and Martin, and others also report pandemic sales booms with new users uh, turning to the guitar as what's called a six string therapy. So here are some of the characteristics of uh, successful musicians, uh, not only from the perspective of uh, the Music Expo and seeing those different uh, areas, but also wearing my hat through torontojobs.ca and recruiting and speaking with musicians and figuring out what they want in their positions. So, so here's, a, here's my list of top 10. Uh, characteristics of successful musicians that I've seen. Number one, they're very active on social media, but they don't rely just on social media. There's a number of artists that will just put stuff out on, on uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, might have a YouTube channel, but they expect somebody's gonna find them. That just doesn't happen. It does happen in the cases of a Justin Bieber kind of person situation, but it's very rare that that happens. Number two is they brand themselves. They have merch or they have a, a certain look or a certain feel and that helps them get to get their get the exposure of their business. And I call it business as in you really got to think of your uh, or your, yourself as a business and really promoting yourself as if you were a business. Number three, they take on a lot of gigs and they, they get any exposure they can get, especially in their early stages of their careers. They build themselves up. They build up their portfolio so they can show people uh, what, uh, what they've done and how their music can help people out and uh, what they do, what type of music they have. Number four is they are responsive to requests on a very timely basis. So they make it easier, easy as possible to, for event organizers like myself and others to work with them. So when we reach out to musicians, we're under the gun as well. Musicians are as well, but if your business is being in music and you wanna promote yourself, you wanna be responsive to requests like that. Number five, they work extremely hard. Uh, they outwork their competition. And by working hard, I don't just mean posting videos. I mean like really contacting people. They make themselves available to media requests, events, and opportunities. So they are very, they anticipate opportunities. They anticipate uh, opportunities where they can promote themselves. Number seven, they put on a smile, even if they aren't happy doing whatever they're supposed to be doing. Sometimes you're doing things that may not be a, that exciting, but you put on a smile and you make it happen. They practice. Not just the music, but how to interview. So there's a gentleman by the name of Michael Williams that you may be familiar with. He, is, uh, he's, he was on Much Music for many years, and he's a real coach. He's a great coach when it comes to interviews. He has interviewed anybody and everybody in the music industry. So a guy like Michael Williams, or another coach that you might have, you wanna speak with them, and you wanna get an understanding of how to be interviewed when you are interviewed by an uh, interviewer, if that makes sense. So when you want to, uh, when you are being asked to do an interview, there's a certain style, there's a certain way to answer questions, to be succinct, and that deliver the point that you want to do, uh, want, that you want to come across. So make sure to reach out and get a person like Michael Williams or someone else that can help you when you're being interviewed. Number nine which is part of a uh, big part of what this session is, is they network. They think about who they can meet. They build relationships. They don't just make contacts, but they build relationships with people. And in the world of the, the job world, there's a, a terminology called the hidden job market. These are jobs that are not advertised. They're not listed on any sites. They're not uh, jobs that you will find online or anything like that. These are jobs that are through word of mouth. And 80 to 90% of jobs are found through the hidden job market. So if you think of your last couple of jobs, how did you find them? Well, maybe it was somebody that uh, referred you, maybe somebody put your name forward to a, a hiring uh, manager or an employer. Uh, so similarly, when it comes to gigs and opportunities, 80 to 90% of opportunities are gonna be found through the hidden job market or hidden network. So you really wanna build your network, you wanna create relationships with people, and not just, hey, they're connected with me on Facebook or, or Twitter, but a meaningful relationship. 
And number 10, no matter how big you get, you don't want to forget about the people who got you there. Really important to remember because they can still be part of that and they want to feel like they were part of your growth as well. So I want to share a story also about Alanis Morissette. So Alanis Morissette had one of the biggest selling albums of all time, uh, Canadian, uh, Jagged Little Pill. She, uh, last December, she was on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. And she's 45 years old. She was promoting the 25th anniversary of that album, Jagged Little Pill, and the new Broadway show of the same name, which features her music. And she talked about how every single label had rejected the album before somebody took a chance on her. And that album went on to sell 33 million copies. So it's, she said, it's, look, it's not an uncommon thing. I get it, that's part of the business. She said she had written 10 songs, uh, and when she got all the rejections, she said, hey, everyone stop. Uh, let's go back to where we were. Let's start writing some more songs. And she said, rejection is not, ins not only inspiring, but in this case, it really was. So keep that in mind, that you will get rejected a lot more times than you will get uh, selected to, uh, to uh, perform and be a big star like Alanis Morissette one day. So I want to share with you some of the job numbers, because uh, salaries and compensation always comes into play when people talk about music and musicians. So what you may want to know is, well, how much do musicians make and what's the average and so on? So while there's no real one master uh, list that gives you specifically you know, what a musician would make, is there's so much variation in what they do and, and so on, uh, there was one report that was released, and if you contact me, I'm happy to share the, the full list with you. But it talked about the uh, median salaries for people that are five years out of school for both male and female, and what those positions are. So for males, for male graduates, five years out, uh, music, people in music make an average of about $38,000 Canadian. That's for males. For females, music is only 22,000. So you see the disparity between wages uh, between male and female uh, singers, even right from early stages, five years out of school. So uh, good information there as well. In terms of the business of music, so during the pandemic, a lot of music venues have been really uh, hard hit. And the, uh, the uh, relief has to come from the government to be able to manage those uh, music venues. So, so John Tory, the mayor of Toronto, announced some help for music venues, and that would include 48 venues that would share in $1.7 million in tax relief. And Tory had said, uh, as part of a study that happened through Toronto, that the music industry in Toronto alone, just not just Toronto, not even all of Canada, is $850 million in size and provides 10,000 jobs. So it's a huge sector in all of Canada and specifically Toronto. I want to also mention a couple of uh, other events that you may want to con connect with and, and uh, make sure that you're aware of when they happen. So the Mississauga Music Awards is a great event that's run by Demetrius Naff, and it's N-A-T-H. He's a great contact person. He runs, he's been running the Mississauga Music Awards for many years, and he awards prizes, just like a real uh, awards show, uh, which has been fantastic, uh, to different segments. So you want to reach out to him because he'll have, uh, I'll, I'll present, for example, the best online contact uh, content winner at the event, but he'll have the best music, best country music, and so on. So you want to check out mississaugamusic.com for information about that as well, and you can watch uh, the awards shows online as well. And then Canada's biggest country music bash is back in London in 2021. Uh, with the CCMA, it's the Canadian Country Music Association Awards, it will be held at the Budweiser Gardens uh, in, on September 12, 2021, uh, five years after they were last held there. So that uh, week-long celebration also includes events such as the Songwriter Series, Sirius XM Top of the Country Showcase, Fan Village, CCMA Legend Show, and more. So you want to check that out uh, as well. So that's again September 12, 2021, the Canadian Country Music Association Awards uh, at Budweiser Gardens in London. So one of my favorite topics, 
some people think it's weird, but I think I love it, is the uh, job numbers in Canada. So just overall, not music, I, I've covered a number of in, uh, good stats and information about, uh, in, about uh, music. Now I'll just talk in general about the Canadian job numbers, and then we'll talk about what's happening in terms of uh, recruitment, uh, in terms of uh, finding jobs, and, and so on. So uh, in September of 2020, Statistics Canada said that the country added 400,000 jobs as Canadians started coming back to school and things came back online. The unemployment rate for September fell to 9%, and it was continuing a slide from 13.7, which was the highest ever recorded in Canadian history at 13.7% in May of 2020. Now, the job numbers have been coming back quite well. Uh, they have uh, initially, Canada lost 3 million jobs between March and April. There was 1 million jobs lost in March. 2020 and 2 million jobs that were lost in April 2020. So a total of 3 million. Over the course of the following five, six months, there's been about 2.3 million jobs that have been recovered. So we're short by about 700,000 as a country, which is still a big amount. In addition, a lot of those jobs that have not come back or have, that have come back are lower pay, less hours, uh, wait freezes, wage freezes, shorter schedules, and so on. So while Statistics Canada may lump all jobs together and say, well, we've recovered X number of jobs, it may not be exactly the, the way it was before the pandemic hit in February of 2020. Fe uh, New Brunswick, actually, interestingly enough, is the province that has the highest recovery in terms of jobs. So they're, they're almost back to where they were before the pandemic hit. Uh, Ontario, Quebec, and BC are furthest from the recovery. In addition, uh, Calgary, as a city, has the highest unemployment rate in Canada for as a Canadian city at 14, just over 14%. Uh, a lot of uh, jobs have come back in education, manufacturing, construction, uh, but uh, they're, interestingly enough, no industry has fully recovered the jobs that have been lost before the pandemic hit. In addition, some other stats that, and I'm always a, a math person and, and love understanding the stats because it helps you understand where things are going. Before the pandemic hit, where we had the lowest unemployment rate in Canadian history, the, there were 2.2 people for every job available. After the pandemic, we're at 4.4. So basically two times the number of people that were possible for every job. So while it, it may seem gloomy and may seem like, well, we're in a real rut, there's a lot of encouraging signs. There's a lot of jobs that are coming back. Uh, a lot of the jobs that were lost were in certain areas. For example, uh, tourism, hospitality, uh, travel, food, uh, retail. So those jobs seem to be coming back, albeit slowly, but they are coming back. And they are calling this generally the she recession or she session because it, this uh, uh, jobs loss specifically impacted females more than males. In the last recession, which is 2008, 2009, when we had the credit crisis, it was known as the he recession or he session. Uh, because 60 to 65 percent of jobs that were lost were males. A lot of manufacturing jobs were males that were ma in male-dominated industries. In this time period, she session, we're seeing those industries that are predominantly female-based. So it's 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 still uh, obviously tough. It's going to take a long time before things get back to normal in the jobs market. But at least we're getting in, in the right direction. At least things are recovering, and, and the government is helping out with those uh, incentives for employers to keep their employees, such as the wage, sub wage subsidy. The US economy is about the same as Canada. Uh, we're about one tenth the size of the labor market in the US. So our Canadian numbers are about one tenth of where the US numbers are. So if we, had, if we have a million jobs that were uh, lost, uh, that were that have still not recovered, and uh, you'll have ten times that many in the U.S. as well. 
So there's a number of HR issues, and uh, employers have to be aware of these issues uh, when they are dealing with things. And as an employee, if you're looking for a job, whether it's a musician or, or otherwise, there's a number of interesting elements to what's going on that are new HR issues that we've never ever had before. So for example, is it too dangerous to bring staff back to the office? Well, the reality is, is that it depends on your business, depends on what safeguards you have as a business. Can a, can a company fire an employee for refusing to wear a mask at work? Can a company fire an employee for not returning to work when asked? Can a company force an employee to take a vaccine if and when it comes out? Can HR companies make employees take COVID-19 tests? So a lot of these issues, these are things that have never happened before. So there's going to be new standards, new uh, employment uh, standards that are going to be coming out fairly regularly. And that's going to really impact what businesses do and how they deal with staff as well. So. Uh, I'm going to get into a, a, a segment here about if you call me back to the office, I'm not coming back. I'm going to quit. So this is a new workforce survey that came out that showed that 32% of Canadians would start looking for a new job that would offer a work from home arrangement or WFH now. Only one in five Canadians will, willing to re, are willing to return to the office once they receive approval from management. So. This basically tells us that most Canadians are not confident about going back to the office and are getting more and more accustomed to working from home. Interestingly enough, we had a lot of issues over the last five, 10 years where managers would be saying no to requests from people working from home. And within a matter of a few days, a few weeks in March of 2020, this issue became resolved because everybody started working from home and that wasn't a concern. In terms of companies also are changing their benefit plans and they're changing what they're providing to employees because of the change in business from the pandemic. So 42% of companies are planning to change their employee benefits as a result of COVID-19. So here are the top five changes in benefit plans or benefit perks. Uh, number one, extra days of annual leave. So while workers obviously can't go on vacations anywhere, they can use those additional days to take care of themselves. Number two is offer online counseling sessions. Psychological health is really important in employees, so this is an op opportunity for employees to use that to take care of themselves as well. Number three, kids clubs. Well, a lot of parents and, and mothers specifically have had their career really challenged because of what's been going on as the uh, responsibilities of home have fell really disproportionately on females. So kids clubs have received some good uh, exposure for having their kids, having the kids of the employees being able to go to these programs so that the employees and the parents can, can work. Number four is food, food gift cards, any kind of food stamps, anything like that that can help employees with their food costs. And finally, number five, virtual health care, which is basically helping employees out with their health uh, needs. Another big change, obviously, is companies looking to shrink their workforce. So 53% of large organizations plan to reduce the size of their office space more than three quarters are going to increase the work flexibility that they give to their employees. This was a poll that was conducted by, uh, for Cisco by Dimensional Research, and it concluded that working from home is going to be the new normal. More than 90% of responded, respondents said they will not return to the office full time. So lots of changes going on when it comes to employers, employees, business, and so on. The other interesting change that's going on in the market is that job seekers are more likely to apply to smaller businesses than larger businesses. So over the course of the six months following the pandemic hitting in, in March, the small to medium sized businesses or SMB postings reduced by 22%, but the amount, the percentage of job applicants who are applying to small to medium sized businesses increased by 25%. So 
people are looking to work in small to medium sized businesses. They're, they like the idea of purposeful mission. They like the idea of opportunity. And employees from larger enterprises who have moved to smaller, smaller to medium sized businesses feel that they are getting promoted faster than they would by staying in large businesses. Now, uh, there's all kinds of different studies that have come up about working from home and the benefits and so on, but one of the uh, situations that has come up is how to deal with working parents who are working from home. So or employers have to recognize that there are issues with employees working from home, parents who are working from home. So some of the ideas that have come up for, for um, uh, working from home for parents, for employers, Flexible working arrangements, for sure. Temporarily reducing workloads, so uh, increasing the amount of time that it takes to complete a project. Uh, temporarily reducing their tasks. And checking in regularly, whether that's by Zoom or other media uh, as well. Another uh, area that uh, is always of interest is uh, sick days. Now, the government has come out and talked about having more sick days allowed for employers, employees paid by the employer. Uh, this has been a challenge over the course of the many, many years uh, that, have, uh, that I've been in recruiting in the last 25 years. And one survey that came out was said, well, are your employees taking more days off or less days off for sick days uh, than before the pandemic? So 50% of employers said they're taking, their employees are taking less time 25% are taking more time. 25% of employees are taking more, uh, more sick days than usual. And 22% said, yeah, probably about the same. So definitely less days overall in general because people are working from home. Now, Black Lives Matter, big issue, has been for many, many years. Uh, it's, made, it's become obviously a bigger issue because of uh, George Floyd and the recent uh, events that have happened in the US. But a, report, a recent report from Fishbowl indicated that 89% of HR workers, now this is HR professionals, expect their organization to respond with public solidarity for BLM. This movement has brought to the forefront the need for every organization to provide diversity and to ensure that inclusion and belonging is part of the culture of that organization. So that's an in, another interesting change that's been layered on uh, through, oh, through the last uh, six months, through the last year, uh, through the COVID uh, issue. Minimum wages. So this is for Ontario specifically. Uh, as of October 1st, 2020, the Ontario government had introduced a, a, a Making Ontario Open for Business Act that applied for this year, which meant that the uh, minimum wage increased by 25, 25 cents per hour across the board. Uh, there was a minimum wage freeze, and if you recall some of the liberal uh, changes that wanted the minimum wage to be $15 an hour, and then it got changed to $14 an hour, well, now it's being phased in, notwithstanding the pandemic. So the general minimum wage, this is for Ontario, went from $14 an hour to $14.25 an hour. The student minimum wage also increased by 25 cents per hour, running from $13.15 to $13.40 an hour. And then the liquor server minimum wage went from $12.20 to $12.45. So another, uh, I mentioned it earlier about working moms and how uh, problems, uh, the, the, the weight of homemaking and school and childcare and, and so on uh, fell disproportionately on, on mothers. Well, a third of working moms thought about quitting their jobs and, due to COVID-19. This is a, a huge number. And a lot of people, and I know some personally myself, that they just couldn't work, and mothers that is, they just couldn't work and look after their kids at the same time. It's just not possible, especially with young kids. So they had to take a leave or they had to quit. So a third of mothers, talked about quitting, and working parents in general said they had a high level of stress without being able to count on daycares and schools being open. Now, with schools kind of coming back online, 
that may be a bit of a relief, but it's not quite the same as full-time schooling. Only one-fifth, so 20% of fathers, felt that way about quitting their jobs and putting their careers on pause. So one-third of women and uh, only one-fifth, or 20% of fathers. So how do you make working from home better for you? Well, there's a few ways. Uh, the BC psychologist had shared some thoughts as to what would help people work better from home. So number one was managing your space and your mental health. So pick one spot in your home and designate that as the work environment that you want to work in and, and not moving between different rooms because that creates problems. You also have to pay attention to diet, exercise, alcohol use, and sleep to stay physically and mentally healthy. Really important. And finally, the species psychologist suggests turn off your devices early in the night so that they're not changing your sleep patterns and limit your social, video, social media and video chats, especially just before bed. What's going on with salaries? Uh, obviously, after, after uh, the pandemic hit, a lot of companies uh, dropped a lot of hours from employees. They took away a lot of their uh, time. They took away a lot of uh, pay. And uh, the uh, human re resources consulting Morneau, uh, firm Morneau Chappelle yeah. estimated that in 2020, only 2% of companies would have f would freeze salaries uh, in 2020. But in 2020, and what actual has, has we're up to over 13% of companies that have, wait, has, have frozen wages. Uh, through this year so far, and they predict more, predict, predict more of the same in 2021. Now, uh, what's there to help small businesses? Well, there's a lot of help on the way for small businesses. They've already released a whole bunch of programs, including the wage subsidy that I just mentioned. Uh, there's also the Canada Emergency Business Account. Uh, there has been the Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program. And the federal government added another, another $600 million to a fund to help small and medium-sized businesses weather the pandemic. Uh, now, of that new money, about $450 million will go to small and medium-sized businesses facing financial pressure to help keep employees and cover costs. The other $150 million is going for rural businesses and communities with access to capital and technical support. So uh, lots of money that's coming through the government to help uh, employees. So I want to Finally, finish by saying uh, you're welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn if there's anything I can help you with. Uh, if uh, you'd like to check out some of our virtual events that we are conducting, uh, we have a number of events that are happening. Uh, you can visit torontojobs.ca slash news. That's torontojobs.ca slash N-E-W-S for information about those events. We run about 14 to 15 virtual events uh, a month right now. So we're, we're running a lot of different events. Uh, if you are looking for a new position, you can check out torontojobs.ca. You can post your resume online and you can sign up for job mail where you can uh, get email alerts when positions come up that might be interesting to you. You can also check out our YouTube channel as well, where we have a number of different videos that are posted there that will help you with your job search as well. And you can always text us. We have our 24-7 text us lines that are always open at 289-206-1651. That's 289-206-1651. And you can follow us on all our social media at Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. I did also write a book called Tales from the Recruiter that you can check out by visiting talesfromtherecruiter.ca. You can visit torontoentrepreneurs.ca if you're a business owner or if you're starting up your music career. Uh, we have a lot of musicians that are within that community that want to know how to build their business. And you, when you're a musician, you really got to think of your business, uh, your career as a business. You have to self-promote and, and go from there. So check out torontoentrepreneurs.ca as well, and you can visit the musicexpo.ca channel, YouTube, uh, not only YouTube channel, but also the website to find out about our upcoming events and how you might want to uh, connect with us uh, from there. 
So I'd like to thank a number of people for today, Royal City Studio, the Royal City Summit, Entrepreneurship in Music. I'd also like to thank AMO Music, Roger Diaz Films, and Eduardo as well for inviting me out to uh, speak to you today. So thanks very much. Like I said, if there's anything I can help you with, by all means, don't hesitate to connect with me. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And thanks very much for watching. Awesome. So what kind of networking strategies would you recommend for young entrepreneurs and musicians? Um, are there any specific situations in your life that changed the way you think of networking and how did your perspective change? Well, you know, I, I think LinkedIn has been a great feature uh, to connect because you can see their profiles, people's profiles, you can see their jobs, you, you can see their work history and it, and it really gives you an idea as to what their careers were. So that would be number one. I, I'd say three things. Number one would be uh, LinkedIn. So a uh, great tool, uh, especially for music. I, I find that musicians tend not to put their profiles on LinkedIn. They use you know, Instagram and they use Facebook and Twitter. Um, but you want to hit a, a very broad cross section. And, and music uh, industry executives and people, they always have their profiles on, on LinkedIn. So you want to connect with them. Uh, number two, I would say to go to a website like Eventbrite. Uh, e v e n t b r i t e for those that don't know. So eventbrite.com. I think establishing the way bright is spelled is very important. Yes, right. <laughs> Somebody might hear bright. I, I don't find it here. So eventbrite.com. Um, there's a lot of uh, events that are posted there, and there's a lot of um, uh, great ways to to find out what uh, people are up to. Right? What events are happening? Most of them are all online right now, uh, of course, because those are great ways of uh, you know, connecting virtually. And uh, I'd say number three is, um, you know, really build up your, um, really build up your, your Facebook and your, uh, you know, Twitter profiles and, and you know, uh, connect with people. Like there's one musician in particular, David Boyd Janes, um, who's a country musician. He quit his job. Uh, he was in sales. He quit his job a couple years ago, uh, went full time into music. Country music guy, uh, fantastic, uh, amazing guy. He won uh, the Emerging Artist Award at Boots and Hearts uh, last summer. Um, but he just threw himself in. But the one thing that differentiates him from a lot of other musicians who have you know, started up their careers is he's very responsive. Uh, he uh, connects with his fans. He personalizes messages. Uh, so if you post something on Facebook on his, his uh, uh, profile, he will like it, you know, very quickly. Like not like three days later, he'll he'll do it very quickly, and he connects with people. Like he'll do Facebook Live, he'll do Instagram Live, um, at random times, and uh, he'll do one after the other. So he'll do like 8:30 at night on a week night. He'll do uh, Facebook, and then at nine o'clock he'll hop into Instagram. So I think really connecting with your fans can build your your network. Right, I think it's important to add a human touch because it kind of gives you sort of that, that the human aspect to it, right? That you're not just right. this robot or this figure, but you're also a person as well. I think people find something endearing about that when, uh, when you're trying to sell yourself. That's right, yeah, yeah. Um, for, so for on the recruiting side, you know, for startups, entrepreneurs beginning to hire, uh, what should they look for in their talent? You know, focus, um, focusing on the inward uh, needs versus the outward uh, on character and quality, and how has technology furthered the effectiveness of networking and recruiting talent? Oh, good question. So let's do one at a time. So cool. the first question. It uh, was loaded. Yeah, I loaded. <laughs> so um, uh, what should uh, recruiters, uh, when they're starting to begin to hire, what should they look for in their talent? Um, I think, uh, especially when you're starting out new and, and you're, you, know, you might be hiring your, fir your first person, I think you l should look at uh, the personality and the fit more than necessarily the technical. Um, I think when you're a bigger company and, uh, you know, like um, uh, say a Microsoft or whatever it is, Apple, well, you're going you're gonna to have very specific roles. But when you're a small company, you wear a lot of hats, like as a musician or a business owner or whatever, entrepreneur. So you have to find somebody that can also kind of play with you, uh, you know, in your game, knowing that they might have to take out the garbage one day and, and you know, do a marketing, uh, um, uh, you know, promo the next day or do social media another time. So I think you got to really look for somebody with broad experience. Um, I don't usually suggest taking somebody from a big company to work for a small company that's a big 
transition to go, uh, say for example, you have somebody who worked at Bell and now they're going into a small business. It's, a, they're, it's very difficult for people to make that adjustment. So, uh, so th that would be you know, two, a couple of things. So number one is uh, you know, hire uh, not so much on the technical. You can also always train on the technical, hire for a bit. Number two is hire people who have been in smaller businesses. And then kind of number three is, um, you know, really um, take your time. You know, take your time because there's, uh, there's a lot of people out there. Uh, don't rush. The first, your first hire is probably the most important because it, it, it's, uh, you need that person to be on your side. Um, you know, one of the first people that I hired, uh, Rachel Mitchell at TorontoJobs.ca, uh, you know, she came right out of Sheridan College in a marketing program, and that was back in uh, 2006. And uh, you know, 14 years later, she's still with me, mm -hmm. right? And, but you know, it took the time, found the right person, you know, the match, and it's, over time, it's just her role has changed and, and grown, and now she's director of business development at the company, and you know, she's done well. But uh, it took a long time to find her. Well, I also think it's that first to hire is important because it's almost a reflection of who you are and an extension of you as well, right? You want yeah. that person to, you know, follow the same, you know, things that you're trying to look for in, yeah. in other employees as well. Yeah, and I would also say, you know, a lot of times what happens with the with the first employee, uh, or really as companies grow, is they try to find somebody from referrals, and uh, well, it's so and so's wife or so-and-so's cousin or so-and-so uh, referred that person and they really try to make it work but in their heart of hearts they really feel that it's not the right person mm -hmm. but they don't cut that person they make it oh they'll get better I'll work with them and they'll and and in the long run it's not a good strategy you know uh, so you got to kind of be very objective yes you could be a bit slanted because it's somebody that you know or somebody referred and you think they're going to do a better job but I've seen a lot of times when people have been hired and they're just not a good match. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the entrepreneur, the business owner makes excuses. It'll, be, it'll get better. Right. <laughs> and, it, and it doesn't. You know, it gets worse. <laughs> um, so you spoke a lot about shifts in the employer-employee relationship as well as uh, the changes in the job markets. Does this mean that more people will be gravitating towards entrepreneurship? That's a great question. You know, when I when I um, when I got into entrepreneurship uh, back in 2005, when I started my my own business, um, it was tough. Like there were, it was tough in the sense like it's tough starting a business, and it's tough like not having a paycheck. Um, but it was tough because um, there weren't the same number of tools that are available in today's world. You know, in today's world, you can Google uh, how to start up a business or how to get financing, uh, how to uh, market your business. Uh, and not just Google, but there's YouTube videos. There's all kinds of uh, support. And I, I think um, the younger generation is much more uh, in tune with what's available. And, and um, you know, the days of having to you know, slowly build and go uh, you know, one step at a time, and I gotta do this job for two, three years, and the next job for two, three years, it's kind of gone, like in the sense of like a younger uh, em employee who doesn't want to, uh, you know, take that, uh, doesn't want to wait. Um, so entrepreneurship is a great opportunity to do this. I mean, I'm I'm an entrepreneur. I love what I do, um, but I think you also have to you have to um, uh, you know bide your time and and work in big companies to see what you don't like. Right, you may end up liking it, who knows, but it certainly is a lot easier today starting up a business than it was uh, 15 years ago when I uh, started up my business. Yeah, I think it's important to go through all those experiences as you alluded to, because it really teaches you about yourself and what you like and what you don't That's like, right? right? Yeah. I mean, you often see it in university, kids get into programs that they think is meant for them, and then two, three years down the road, they realize that, no, it's something else, and sometimes you, you, sometimes you want to test those waters so you can avoid situations like that as That's well, right? right? Yeah. Um, so how about in music specifically, as you spoke about instrument companies uh, having record uh, high sales, is the same shift happening towards people leaving? their jobs to fully pursue music um, well you see music is is really tough right now because of the the venues that are closed uh, they can't have they don't have gigs um, I, I think a lot of musicians are now in the transition of trying to figure out okay well I can't do music full-time like I used to 
So now I got to go back in and get maybe a part-time job that I didn't expect I would have to do. So it is tougher for sure. Um, the ones that I, you know, I can think of a few that have that are sticking it out and that know like that this is what it's going to take. And I know I'm going to be, you know, down here for a little bit, but I'm going to keep slugging it out. I'm keep going to keep posting stuff on my uh, social media. I'm going to stay connected with my fans. Uh, I'm going to do whatever gigs that are out there. Um, I, I think you got to be very, um, you, you have to be very um, uh, un entrepreneurial, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. Susie Corey, uh, I don't know if you know her. She, she's she's a, a musician, country musician. She uh, was working as a flight attendant for many years. And um, she had the, op she always wanted to do music. So she did music and, uh, you know, obviously COVID hit. She was doing shows and concerts and, and doing these gigs, plus doing her music recording. And um, she was like, well, I, you know, I, can't, I just can't sit here. I, I need to get out there. And, and what are the rules about having um, shows? So she put on a drive-in uh, show. She, she, got, she, she did all the following. She, she found a place, uh, which was in Cavan, Ontario, which is uh, east of Peterborough. Uh, it was a big yard. Um, she got a date, she did the marketing, she got uh, six or seven performers like other musicians, she built a small stage, uh, she had all the cars where she painted spray paint on the grass so people knew where they uh, would uh, go. And um, you, you know, she charged, um, I don't know, whatever it was, 30, 40, 50 bucks a car. And uh, she said, hey, bring all your friends and, and come on out. And, and it was a great Saturday, the weather was fantastic. And, um, you know, she was somebody that pivoted, right? And, and I said, look, I'm, I'm going to uh, change things up. She called it the Love Revolution Tour. And she went out and she did it in Nashville, uh, of wow. all places. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so she did the same thing. This was in back in August of uh, July or August of 2020. And then in, all of a sudden, I see this thing come up uh, on her feed saying that she's doing the Love Revolution Tour in, in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, isn't that creative, right? But, you know, those are the people that are going to survive. Like, you know, they, they are creative. Um, you know, like there's still companies that are paying for music, um, uh, you know, uh, mu um, commercials that are made that need jingles or music uh, background. Well, those, are, those gigs are there, but you got to go out and find them. And you have to be opportunistic and you have to find out who those people are. And going back to your question about networking, um, you know, really network. Who are those people that make, make those decisions? And trying to find people that are like-minded, right? Yeah. Like, how, how do I find them? Like, where, where do they... Because, again, just like the hidden job market, these opportunities, a lot of them are hid, hidden. You know, they're, they're not posted somewhere. Hey, we're looking for a music musician. Uh, they reach out to people. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to be very opportunistic. And uh, I find that a lot of musicians aren't that opportunistic. They... they um, uh, they uh, know they have to be, but man, like you try to get them to respond to stuff. And I, I, as the putting my event organizer hat on for the music expo, I mean, you know, we're, we are helping you. We're trying to help you. So respond to us quickly, respond to us on a timely basis. And I can see the ones like some respond like that. You know, they're on online. Hey, I understand if you have a meeting or you're doing work or whatever it is, but certainly within, you know, 24 hours, you should be responding. Yeah, I think there's something to say about, um, you know, I've, I've I've worked a couple of jobs where, you know, I have a managerial role and um, I'm finding that a lot of p younger people are having the inability to have those face-to-face -face conversations and there's a, a bit of a, a fear, but I think, you know, like you said, it's really important for you to stand out and respond right away like that. I, I find that's something that I, I run into very often, right? And mm -hmm. I think the ones that are eager are the ones that are going to su succeed because they're the ones that are, are communicating right away. Yeah. And, and well, I just wanted to make, say this story because, um, you know, when I was going through my accounting days, uh, you know, I worked at uh, KPMG, a uh, big accounting firm. Mm -hmm. And uh, man, I was the shyest guy out there. And, um, you know, if I saw a partner, I'd look, not only did I look at them as they were God, but I was also afraid of, of, of seeing them. So if, they, if I was going to the washroom and they were ahead of me and they went into the washroom, I'd be like, I'm coming, I'm coming back in about 10 minutes. Right? I'm going to go back to my desk and then come back because I didn't want to be in the washroom with them. <laughs> but as I, uh, alone that is, uh, but <laughs> for <dare> not, but, <laughs> but, um, but what I would say is that, um, you know, as I'm getting older, 
Uh, and as I got older and as I got into recruiting and I, as I realized how the game works in terms of opportunities and jobs and um, opportunities that you wouldn't have otherwise known, it, it's, it's not to be afraid of people that might have a title of president or a director of music or whatever it is. Reach out to them, you know, talk to them. And maybe they don't have something for you now, but let them know who you are. Right. I think it's really important to put those feelers out, right? Yeah. Because you want someone to know that, you know, this is my passion and hopefully they think of you right away when that happens. That's so, right. Mark, so, this has been such a pleasure. Thanks, Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm, you just filled my head with a wealth of amount of knowledge and I'm sure you've done that for our viewers as well. Awesome. So thank you once again for your well, time. Um, again, uh, I want to thank uh, everyone behind the scenes and I want to thank Mark for his time here. Uh, Royal City Summit here at the Royal City Studios in Guelph. I'm Dee. This is Mark. And uh, I want to thank you once again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.